Good day, grade 11s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. I hope that you had a good break and that you're ready to attack the physical science with all the energy that is required. Um, in this lesson, we're going to do a couple of exam paper type questions on the work that we covered last term, which was reflection and refraction. Um, well, the last stuff, stuff that we covered. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move on to, if we've got time, we're going to move on to some ideal gases. OK, so let's do that now. Um, so let's do that. It says a ray of light travels from a where n equals one into an unknown clear mineral. So here is your clear mineral, and here is your a, and here is your ray of light traveling into it. The light ray in the a strikes the unknown clear mineral at an angle of incidence of 53 degrees, and the angle of refraction is 37 degrees. It says they want to know, they want us to calculate, first of all, the refractive index of the unknown clear mineral. And in order to do that, we need to use Snell's law. So grade 11s, as I keep saying, you guys always, always, always need to um, have your formula sheets with you. And then you need to know, well, know how to use the formula sheets. The whole point about this grade 11s is that I want you guys to make sure you know how to use your formula sheets. It needs to be a tool that you use all the time, okay? So have it always with you. You should be having a pen, pencil, ruler, eraser, calculator, formula sheet, and your textbook if you have one. I say if you have one because some schools do not give textbooks out, they give notes. Okay, so the formula that we're looking at is N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two. Okay, so we can rearrange this, but what we can do is we can let the number one be the A because it's the in the one that's coming is the rays coming from okay so therefore n1 is going to be one sine theta one is going to be the angle of incidence so therefore that is going to be the angle that the ray hits the barrier at from here so that's the angle of incidence which is 53 degrees is equal to N2, which is the refractive index of the unknown clear material, multiplied by the sine of the angle of refraction, which in this case is 37 degrees. Therefore, do you agree that we can say that sine 53 degrees divided by sine of 37 degrees is equal to N2? And then what we need to do is get out our calculators. So let's do that, okay, and I don't know why my, I don't know why it's doing that. Let's see if I can hide it quickly. Properties, that'll be why it hasn't been hidden. Okay, there you go. Now we can see the whole calculator, which is always better. So what do we want to do? We want to do sine of 53 degrees. So we're going to go sine of 53 divided by, divided by sine of 37, close bracket equals, and you'll see it's 1.327 and a whole bunch of numbers. Remember in science, what do we do? We always round off to two decimal places. So therefore it's 1 comma 3, 3. So therefore N2 is 1 comma 3, 3. So there we go, 1 comma 3, 3. Now they want to know what is the speed of light in the unknown clear material. So you have a formula as well that says N is equal to C over V, C divided by V, where N is the refractive index. C is the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times by 10 to the 8, and yes, you're given that. And V is going to be the speed of light in the unknown clear material. So what we're going to do, or clear minerals, should I say. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for V. So the way we do this is we've got NV is equal to C. Therefore, V is equal to C divided by N. Now, the cool thing grade 11's about science is this. If, say, you got the refractive index of this unknown clear mineral incorrectly, and I didn't check that I did round off correctly. Yes, I did. Let's say you got, say you got this wrong. Maybe you got, I don't know, uh, 1.12 or something silly. Okay, or say, yeah. Then what happens is, as long as whatever you worked out here, you put into this formula, you will get, and you might work, work this out correctly, you will get all those marks. That's called method marks, and you can work down from there, okay? So that's quite cool. So therefore, our V is going to be 3 times by 10 to the 8 divided by 1 comma 3, 3. So let's get out our calculators. And we've got 3 exponent 8 all divided by 1.33 equals a really big number. Okay, so now let's see if we can get that into scientific mode. So let's go to mode. No, that's not where we want to be. We want to go to shift mode. Okay, let's just go back to, um, hmm, that's very irritating. Okay, so I'm gonna have to do it again, but let's just do the shift mode. And we want scientific seven and we want three. And it's going to let's do this again. It's three exponent eight divided by 1.33 equals 2.26 times by 10 to the eight. So that is equal to 2.26 times by 10 to the eight meters per second. So let me write it here 2.26 times by 10 to the eight meters per second. So that's a very, very cool thing to know that this is slow down, which we kind of expected it to. And we now know the speed of light in this unclear, I mean, the unknown clear mineral. Now it says, okay, give two conditions necessary for total internal reflection to occur. So first of all, do you agree that light needs to change from um, be going from the more optically dense, okay, to the less optically dense, to the less optically dense. Okay, that's the one thing. The next thing is that you need to realize that the angle of incidence, angle of incidence has to be greater than the critical angle has to be greater than the critical angle. Right, now I need to erase because I'm going to have need space. So the question next reads, light traveling from glass, which has got an angle, I mean a refractive index of 1.52, strikes the boundary with an angle of incidence of 52 degrees. Okay, and it's moving into A. It says calculate the critical angle of for glass. So it's telling you that the light is, oopsie, sorry. It's telling you, I did it again, <laughs> that the light is hitting the boundary with an angle of incidence of 52 degrees. But it's asking you first to calculate the critical angle. So we know that the critical angle results in a refracted angle of 90 degrees, okay? So that's what we need to work out. So N1 is gonna be 1 comma 5, 2. And then we're working out sine theta 1. We're working out theta 1 because that is the angle of incidence that you need to get this angle, to get the sine of 90, okay? So therefore we can say that sine of theta is going to be sine 90 divided by 1 comma 5 2. Okay, so we need a calculator for that. So let's get out our calculator. So we're going to go AC. So we go sine of 90. Um, where were we? Where were we? Sine of 90, close bracket, divided by 1.52 equals 25 over 38. But now we want the angle. So what do we do? We go shift sine of the answer and we close the bracket and it equals 
So that's 41.1. Okay, if you don't understand that, we can go shift setup and you go back to normal math one and we go one. Oh dear, that's not what I wanted at all. Shift setup and we want normal eight. Um, eight and we want two. So if I did this again, it would be shift sign of a fraction and in this case it would be sign of 90 close bracket divided by 1.52 close bracket equals 41.139 which rounds off to 41.14 degrees so theta is equal to 41 comma 14 degrees so that there is the critical angle any angle past that is going to cause total internal reflection so the next question says will the light ray be totally internally reflected the answer is yes and why because the angle of incidence is bigger than the critical angle Okay, let's move on. It says a learner investigates a change in broadness from the central band in a diffraction pattern when light passes through a single slit of different widths. Okay, so what they're doing is they're sending light through the slit. Okay, and then what they're doing is looking at the pattern it makes on the screen. Okay, and what she is seeing is that there are different, and she's playing with the single slit of different widths. So she's changing that width size. She's changing that width size. Okay, now it says name two variables. Okay, sorry, she uses blue light of a wavelength of 5 times by 10 to the negative 7 meters, and the apparatus is shown in the diagram below. So it says name two variables that are kept constant during this investigation. The first variable would be the wavelength of the light. Okay, the wavelength of the light is important. And secondly, do you agree she is keeping the distance of the screen from the boundary? Okay, she's keeping that constant. Right, now it says, what is the relationship between the amount of diffraction and the width of the aperture? Okay, the width of the aperture and the amount of diffraction. And what you need to know is that that is inversely proportional. Inversely proportional. In other words, the smaller the slit, the greater the sorry let's put it this way the greater the angle of diffraction okay the and greater the angle of diffraction okay now it says proportional the learner now uses a narrower slit how will the broadness of the central band change only writes increase decreases or remains the same and give an explanation well the correct answer is going to be it increases because the smaller the slit the narrower the slit the more the greater the fraction which means that this angle has got to get bigger so therefore it's going to reach exactly the same position of, for example, this double band, but at further away from the center. So the smaller the slit, the greater the diffraction. It says now, how would the diffraction pattern change if the learner replaces, okay, your, this is no longer in your curriculum, so you can just ignore that. Okay, let's move on. Right. Oh, maybe it's not. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Okay, if you use a single, a double sit instead of a single sit, okay, what happens is that you end up with an interference pattern. And what you will have is um, equidistant light and dark bands equidistant light and dark bands okay because what's going to happen is exactly this 
You will have lines where there will be destructive interference and lines where there will be constructive, actually that's constructive, and destructive interference. Lines where you have destructive interference will be black and the lines where you have constructive interference will be the color of whatever light you are shining. Okay, so that's what happens if you have a diffraction pattern where you replace a single slit with a double slit. Okay, let's move on. It says monochromatic red light passes through a double slit as shown in the diagram. So there's your double slit, right? So the double slit is the equivalent of having two point sources. All that's really happening is that in order for it to be in phase, what they do is they send a single source through this. There's your single source, okay? Just coming through. Then instead of, okay, so in other words, instead of having two sources that you're trying to get in phase and you're trying to get them to basically have this type of pattern, a better thing to do would be to take a single source, which they've done over here, and then put a double slit. So what the double slit does is it basically mimics having two single sources, but, but, They've got exactly the same phase. They're, they're in phase. The waves are perfectly in phase because they all came from the single source, okay? So we've got this monochromatic red light passes through a double slit. Circular wave fronts advance towards the screen as shown between the slits and the screen as dotted lines and solid lines. The solid lines represent crests and the dotted lines represent troughs. So what I'm gonna do just to make it easier is I'm going to, for you guys to see is I'm just going to make the solid lines in red. Okay, there is a reason, I'm not going mad. So here's the solid line. Okay, right. So do you see that yeah, a solid line is meeting a solid line? Yeah, a dotted line is meeting a dotted line. There, okay, it doesn't go that far. Whereas, and here, a solid line is meeting a solid line. Here, a solid line is meeting a solid line. There, a dotted line is meeting a dotted line, a dot and that. So what is that? That is constructive interference. Similarly, yeah, solid line, and that would be a solid line. These two are dotted lines. So in other words, this would be red, that would be red, and that would be red. Whereas yeah, where we've got a solid line meeting a dotted line, that's a crest meeting a trough, that is gonna be destructive interference. Yeah, you've got a crest meeting a trough, destructive interference, etc., etc. okay? So those will be black. Okay, now let's carry on. It says interference pattern, of interference of the circular wave fronts results in interference pattern, P, Q, R, etc. represents the centers of the different bands in the interference pattern. Okay, it says define the term interference, which is just a definition which talks about um, the interaction between two waves. Okay, so you guys need to learn the definitions in B. Go learn your definitions. It says what type of interference is taking place at point A? Give a reason for your answer. Well, we've already mentioned it, that this is a trough meeting a trough. So therefore, the type of interference that's happening is constructive interference. And the reason is because a trough is meeting a trough, therefore it's going to be additive and it's going to end up with a deep trough. Now it says, is band P a dark band or a red band? Refer to the type of interference involved and the type of line produced to explain how you arrived at this answer. Okay, so as we've mentioned already, when you look at P, you can see that it comes from destructive interference. There's a solid line and a dotted line. So it's a trough, a crest meeting a trough. Here's a crest meeting a trough. Here is a crest meeting a trough. So that is a full destruct line of destructive interference. So P gives you a line of destructive, destructive interference. And if that's the case, it means that P is going to be black. It's going to be black, okay? So it's going to be a dark band or dark band, not black, dark band. And the reason for that is because of the fact that it is destructive interference. So the trough is meeting the crest and you end up with zero. 
It says in what way will the pattern on the screen change if red light is replaced by blue monochromatic light and why? Okay, so the theory goes that sine theta is proportional to the wavelength. Okay, sine theta is proportional to the wavelength. So now if we have to think about this, we know that velocity times the wavelength is equal to, let's try again, wavelength times frequency is equal to C, okay? We also know that your, the thing goes Roy G Biv, and then it's ultraviolet and infrared. So blue has got a higher frequency it's got a higher frequency, therefore it's going to have a lower wavelength. Wavelength, right? Smaller wavelength. Means the angle is going to be smaller. So therefore we'd say, what is it? Why? In what way will the pattern on the screen change? Well, these lines will be closer to each other. They'll be much closer to each other. And the reason for that is because blue will have a lower wavelength, smaller wavelength than red, and their wavelength is proportional to the angle of refraction. There you go. Nice question, hey? Right, now, so we've done questions on refraction. We've done some questions on diffraction and interference. Now, let's have a look at this. It says a water break at the entrance to the harbor consists of a rock barrier with a 50 meter wide opening. Okay. Ocean waves of 20 meter wavelengths approach the opening straight on. Light of a wavelength of 500 times by 10 to the negative 9 meters strikes a single set of width 30. Which waves are diffracted to a greater extent? Okay. Okay, so we've got... Um, we've got, look at this. Okay, we've got a water break. Hmm, it's interesting. Okay, so we've got a water break. It tells you that this is 50 meters wide, and it tells you that the wavelength, ocean waves, are 20 meters apart. These are 20 meters apart, okay? Whereas, yeah, we've got light of a wavelength of 500 times by 10 to the minus 9 meters. So the wavelength is, this wavelength here, is 500 times by 10 to the minus 9 meters, okay, is pushed through a single slit, a single slit of 30 times by 10 is the negative 9 meters. Okay, and it says which waves will are diffracted to the greater extent? Well, it's obviously going to be the light waves. And the reason is, if you look here, this rock barrier is way bigger than the wavelength, okay? And the wavelength, whereas this, you're trying to push this wave with a very big wavelength through this tiny hole. Okay, so the smaller the hole is with respect to the wavelength, obviously the bigger the diffraction. So therefore this is going to, the light wave is going to have way bigger refraction. Okay, diffraction, shall I say. Now you can have a look at this and do you see that says the diffraction pattern below, sketch Sketch what you expect to change. Okay, for the diffraction pattern below, sketch what you expect to change if. Okay, so now, first of all, do you agree that this is a single set? Because we've got a very broad um, central band and then alternating light and dark, which go away. So let's just have a look at that. It's exactly what's happening here. We've got a very broad central band and then we've got alternating light and dark that go smaller and smaller and smaller the gaps. So that is what's happening here. Okay, now they're saying the wavelength gets larger. Now, let's just think about this again. The angle of diffraction is proportional to the wavelength, okay? The angle of diffraction is also proportional to one over the aperture, okay? One over the aperture. Right, I mean, the slit width, the A is the slit width, okay? And remember that wavelength and frequency equals C. 
Okay, so now they're saying the wavelength gets larger. If the wavelength gets larger, what is going to happen to this diffraction pattern? Do you agree it's going to get wider? Okay, so therefore, I'm not going to draw it. I'm just going to tell you that the wavelength, if the wavelength gets larger, the broadband in the central broadband is going to get longer. You're going to have a longer broadband because it's going to be diffracted more. Whereas if the wavelength gets smaller, then you end up with a smaller broadband in the middle, smaller central broadband. Okay, if the slit width gets bigger, we know that this is inversely proportional, okay? So what is going to happen to the angle of diffraction? It's going to get, if the slit width gets larger, the angle of diffraction is going to get smaller. So therefore, this broadband in the middle is going to get smaller, okay? The broadband in the middle, the broadband is going to get smaller, okay? Why? Because the angle of diffraction is proportional to one over the slit width. And if it gets smaller, the broadband is going to get wider and longer, okay? Now let's talk frequency because frequency is interesting. We know that the angle is proportional to the wavelength, okay? But we also know that wavelengths multiplied by frequency is equal to the speed of light. So therefore, do you agree that we could say that wavelength is proportional to one over frequency, okay? Therefore, instead of saying theta is proportional to wavelength, what could we say? We could say theta is proportional to 1 over frequency, which means as the frequency gets smaller, okay, what's going to happen to the angle of diffraction? It's going to get bigger. So the broad band in the middle is going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger, okay? Whereas as the frequency gets larger, the fraction of a whole gets smaller and therefore the theta gets smaller. So therefore, the broadband in the middle gets narrower. Okay, do you understand that? Okay, now, now we need to move on to ideal gases. So those questions with typical exams have questions from old exemplar um, exam papers that I found. Um, they were basically the exam papers that have been set by the government. Um, so please make sure you know how to do all those questions on diffraction, ref internal reflection, refraction, um, and 2D and 3D waves, etc, etc. Okay, now let's move on to ideal gases. So this is what you should know from grade 10. Okay, this is the kinetic theory of gases as far as you know. Okay, first of all, gases are made of particles. So these statements might seem a bit obvious to you now, but you need to understand that this is stuff that was developed by the scientists um, over a large period of time. Okay, and what you need to understand as well is that um, it is kind of breakthrough science for a long time. They used to say that gas particles, gas particles didn't have volume or they didn't exist. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what you learnt about in grade ten. Okay, so so far what you've learned is that gas particles, gases are made of particles. Fair enough. Also, the size of these particles is very small compared to the distance between the particles. Okay, so. Therefore, we don't have to worry too much about the size of the particles. We don't have to worry too much. The particles are constantly moving because they've got kinetic energy, okay? Um, and you need to understand, we're talking about gases now. So therefore, the particles are going to be constantly moving. They have kinetic energy, but they move in straight lines at different speeds. And the reason they're at different speeds is because they've got different amounts of kinetic energy, okay? There are attractive forces between the particles, but they're very weak in gases, okay? They're very weak. And the collisions between the particles and the walls of the container do not change the kinetic energy of the system. That's what you've learned so far, that the collisions between the particles and the walls of the container do not change the kinetic energy of the system. 
And then finally, the temperature of a gas is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. And that's an incredibly important definition. You really need to make sure you know it. You're going to need it all the way through till the end of matric. And if you do science, especially chemistry, at varsity, you're going to need this definition. The temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. Okay, so before we carry on learning about ideal gases and ideal gas laws, we need to learn some definitions. Okay, so first of all, pressure. Pressure is interesting because it's a measure of the number of collisions of the gas particles with each other and with the size of the container they're in. Okay, so it's a measure of the number of collisions gas particles have with each other and with the size of the container. Now temperature is, this is a very, very important, I've said it to you already, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles, okay? Now an ideal gas, we're going to be talking about more about ideal gases and real gases and the difference between them. Um, in this lesson as well as in the next lesson that we have on this section which will be on Tuesday. Um, sorry, today is Tuesday, on Thursday. An ideal gas has identical particles. They're all identical with zero volume. There are no intermolecular forces between them. And the atoms and molecules in the ideal gas move at the same speed, at exactly the same speed, okay? Whereas a real gas behaves more or less like ideal gases, except at high pressures and low temperatures. And grade 11s, they love asking, they love asking, what are the exceptions? When do real gases not behave like ideal gases? And then you have to say at high pressure and low temperature. And don't get too confused. Don't say high temperature and low pressure. It has to be high pressures and low temperatures. So this is what we're talking about, okay? With ideal gases, we learned that the gas particles did not take any volume, take up, did not did not take up any volume. Okay, they didn't take up any volume, right. But in real gases, the particles take up volume. So when your pressure is very high, your molecules are compressed, okay? And the volume of the molecules becomes significant. Okay, it actually makes a difference to everything. So this means that the total volume available for the gas molecules to move is reduced. Okay. In other words, before we used to think of the molecules as not taking up any space. So therefore, they had all the volume of the container to move around, even if the container got pushed and shrunk into a very small space. But if your pressure is very high, in other words, we decrease the volume of the container. Then the volume of the molecules becomes important. And that means that the total volume available for these particles to move around is less. So that means the collisions become more frequent and the pressure of the gas will be higher than it would be, for, than it would be expected to be for an ideal gas. So in other words, if you have volume versus pressure, for an ideal gas, you've got this beautiful little exponential curve that goes, Nyow. okay. For a real gas, a real gas has got volume. So therefore, it's not going to go all the way down the same amount, okay? You're going to end up with more volume at a higher pressure than you expected, okay? Next, we've got forces of attraction. Um, do exist between molecules. Okay, so again with ideal gases, we didn't take into consideration forces of attraction. We figured that the forces of attraction were so weak that they didn't play a part. Okay, but at very low temperatures, the speed of the molecules decrease. Okay, and this means they move closer together. Um, 
and the intermolecular forces then take greater effect okay so as the attraction between the molecules increases your movement decreases and then you've got fewer collisions between them um okay so at low temperatures the speed of the molecules decreases right which means the molecules move closer together which means the intermolecular forces now take greater effect okay so the, as the attraction between the molecules increases so the movement decreases and then because movement decreases we've got fewer collisions between them okay so the pressure of gas at low temperature is lower than would be expected for an ideal gas, okay? The pressure of the gas at a low temperature is lower than what we would have expected for an ideal gas. But what's important as well is this bendy curvy thing here. You will notice that it doesn't go down to zero and the reason it doesn't go to zero is because of the force of attraction between them so if the temperature is low enough or the pressure is high enough the real gas will liquefy so you'll end up with no gas after all and you end up with a liquid okay right now before we carry on teaching you again about this we need to learn our variables we need to learn about what the variables are and what the units are and you need to understand some stuff. So first of all, the first variable we talk about is pressure and the symbol is P, but the SI units are Pascals. Now, the standard pressure is 101 kilopascals, okay? But they do use millimeters mercury and atmospheres, but you don't have to worry about that too much because the standard unit for pressure is Pascals. The volume is, they're calling it SI units is cubic meters. And what's interesting is when we do the rest of chemistry, okay, when we do the rest of chemistry, when we work out concentration and everything else, we use decimeters cubed, okay? We use decimeters cubed. But, but with ideal gases and the gas laws, we use cubic meters. You've got to remember about the cubic meters okay and a cubic meter is equal to about a thousand decimeters cubed which is the same as 1000 liters so one decimeter cubed is equal to one liter okay moles is obviously mole universal gas constant um, don't worry about it too much and temperature is measured in Kelvin and we'll talk about that in a minute okay and Kelvin equals the degree Celsius plus 273. So now we're going to talk about Boyle's law. Okay, there are three laws that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Gay-Lussac's law, which is actually named after two French gentlemen. So Boyle decided to relate pressure and volume in an enclosed gas. Okay. So what he said was that the pressure of the fixed quantity of gas is inversely proportional to the volume it occupies so long as the temperature remains constant. So we have to keep the temperature constant. And then what it says is the pressure of a fixed quantity of gas is inversely proportional to the volume. The pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So we could actually say therefore that pressure is equal to K over V. Okay, the pressure is inversely proportional to the volume, which then means that we could say PV is K, where that is a constant. Now, obviously then, if that's the case, and I mean that's P1 and V1, and that's P1 and V1, then it's obvious that if we had another pressure at another point in time, the same gas has a different pressure, then it would have a similar volume, or well, I mean it would have a different volume, but it would have the same ratio. So in other words, we can find one point where P1 
V1 is equal to K. That means we can find a second point for P2 V2 equals K. And then we obviously go, well, these two are the same, therefore P1 V1 has to equal P2 V2. Okay, I want to show you an animation, but I've kind of run out of time. So we will start the lesson, yeah, on Thursday with this animation. Have a great day. Thank <sighs> you.